thank you all for coming today. I'm glad we've got such a nice, a nice group. So yeah, this class is going to discuss the various outs um, that we have for exiting the contract. And as you guys know, the contract is very um, pro buyer versus seller. So if we we're going to start with seller because really there is only one main out and that is that the seller has whereas we have um, about 20 or so for for the buyer. So the seller's biggest out is if the buyer fails to deliver earnest money within three days after the effective date of the contract is when they're supposed to deliver it. So the question is, what happens if, if the buyer um, does fail to do that? The contract is not necessarily void. Okay, um, so you've got you've got a slacker buyer who doesn't get it in, and you know, and it's now day four or day five. Doesn't mean the contract's dead, but this at that point the seller has the option they could terminate the contract if they wanted. So let's say you know right after the day after it got signed, someone else wanted to wanted to um, put an offer in. It was going to be a better offer than they can they can they can cancel it and and get get rid of the buyer so and if the buyer does not um deliver the con the earnest money um ever throughout the contract um the the seller has the right to cancel at any point so but again it, it he doesn't have to cancel it he can keep going with it but um but that is a big risk you know for the buyer and a big plus for the seller Okay, now on to the buyer's outs, of which there are many. So the most basic one that we all deal with all the time is the option period. So, and again, just like the delivery of the earnest money, it is three days that it must be delivered. And by, and three days, again, with residential contracts, um, we look at calendar days versus business day with the one exception being if the third day the day that the money is due is on a weekend or a holiday and thus the title company is not open then it would be due the next business day so for instance if you execute a copy a contract on a thursday day one would be friday two saturday three sunday um, you would then have, since day three is a day when it's closed, you would have to the end of the day on, on Monday to, to get your, your fees delivered. So whereas if you don't deliver the option fee, um, unlike the, um, you know, that is just the, the buyer is not in default um, and the seller doesn't have any you know, rights of term of cancellation if the if the buyer fails to deliver the option fee. But if the buyer does deliver the option fee, then of course the buyer has the unrestricted right to cancel the contract for the number of days inserted in the contract. So, and something that's very important to keep it in mind if you're extending the option, which often happens, you know, you're trying to get a contractor out there and, you know, and it's not happening within the five or seven days you have in there. And on the amendment to contract, you, um, you, you want to extend it for another couple of days. Um, you would check that, that provision and it is imperative that you put in a dollar amount. I mean, it can be $1, it can be $10, it cannot be $0 um, that the buyer needs to pay to the seller to extend the option period. If they don't do it, um, it, it, it or even if they just put in that amount, but they never deliver it, even like I said, if it's a dollar, just Venmo the dollar, sorry, you know, or deliver them a dollar bill. So I, I've had a situation with an agent before. I mean, she was she was on the seller side and the buyer never, you know, they did the extension. They never delivered that dollar. And, you know, they didn't they didn't have an, their option. It ended, you know, and they didn't have the extension. So um, this is taken very seriously, you know, in in Texas with all the, the truck and, and legal rulings. So. 
Um, again, this is the biggest right that the buyer has to cancel. So make sure your buyers are in compliance with it. Angela, okay. can I ask a yeah. question or do you want to wait till the end? No, go ahead and ask any questions you have. I should have said that up front. Please go ahead. So the, the, it's Steve, by the way. You probably figured that out. Um, read the seller back out. If, if the um, earnest money is delivered on day four, for instance, mm -hmm. does this, can the seller still say, well, actually, no, you're still late. I'm still going to back out. Or do they have to back out? Um, no, if they days. accept it, so that's a great question. Um, so if they accept it, um, and now that it's kind of, you know, now that it's all delivered to the title company, right, you got to make sure that the title company, if you don't want to accept it, let the title company know if you're on the seller side, and it's day four, and you're thinking, okay, I want to, you know, I, I don't want to deal with these people anymore, and you're working on getting a termination together, let the title company know that you're not going to accept the earnest money, the late earnest money from the from from the buyer because if you do accept it then that means you, you're you're waiving you know the right to cancel and that the um and and so you won't won't have the lateness as a factor once it's been accepted okay. does that make sense and it does yeah and then okay. on the buyer side um mm -hmm. if the buyer fail, fails to pay the option fee within three days do they still get and they say they pay the option fee on day five but they have a seven day option period do no. they still get the option period or that's it? There's no, there's no option no, period. No, they don't get it. It's time of, it's, it says time is of the essence in okay. somewhere. That's what I thought. That's yeah, I think it's an, I didn't copy that paragraph. Yeah, in big bold letters, which means, um, no, that, that is one of the, one of the, the delivery is, is very strict on that. So, so if, if the buyer had on day two done inspections and was going through a whole bunch of repairs, whatever, whatever, but still never paid the option fee until day four, of the seven day option period, the seller can say, well, no, you didn't pay the option fee. I'm not going to. Exactly. Gonna yeah, they don't pay the option period, the option fee by day three. They do not have an option. Right. But they yeah. could then. So if, if the seller doesn't come to the table regarding any repairs on day four, can the buyer still back out or they waived that right to back out because they didn't pay. The they option waived fee. it by not paying their option fee within three days. That's what I thought. OK, thank yes. you. OK, great question. Okay, Actually, so the next buyer out has to do can I ask with one last question on that oh, topic. Is yeah. that okay? So do you're saying let the title company know? Is that something that you have to do a, an official notice of seller's termination? If let's just say they didn't pay within three days and on the fourth day you decide that you're going to move on. Is it like, do you have to do it very formally, like through check document? Or do you like how you said, how do I let the title company know? I would do it. Yeah, I would let the title company know and the um, and the and the buyer know th that you're going to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And always, you know, that's something that's one of my last slides. But, you know, that make sure you let the title company know you let this you let the agent know and you let the, the and you do directly communicate it anytime there's this official notice, you know, even though we're not supposed to communicate with the um you know, with the principals, if you're giving notice, you need to give it to those people, all those people listed in that notice section. Okay. Um, it's more than just an email, like giving a heads up right now. We're going yeah, to have it notice is. Well, yeah, yeah, but you know, you could give it in the email. I mean, it does, it could be, it doesn't have to be a track form for yeah. that, but just make sure it's going to the right people. It could be an email, but going gotcha. to the right, all the right. Okay. People. Good point to include the principal. I wouldn't have thought of that. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. no, do that. That's really important. And, and, you know, delivery uh, of these notices is, is key. Um, yeah. So interesting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So title commitments, um, failure to deliver the title commitments within 20 days, the title company is supposed to furnish buyer a commitment for title insurance. Um, and along with its, um, with its exceptions and exceptions are being things having to do that are filed that the, the title insurance is not going to cover such as easements, encroachments, things like that. Um, what is key here? Usually the title, you know, the title companies are pretty on top of it, right? So they are going to probably get within 20 days. Usually, you know, we get it within a week as, as a general rule. Um, and then if they don't, it's an automatic 15 day extension. So effectively it's like 35 days, which is really long. But the one thing that often 
ish happens is that although they'll get you the title commitment, they won't have all of the exception documents sometimes, which is going to mean like everything that was filed, you know, caught clear, legible copies of, you know, an, an easement that would that was filed in the county tax records in 1936 or something. Um, if those aren't all there and your buyer is, is looking, you know, for a way to get out of the contract, that might that might be something um, they can look into. You know, you have to dig through all the all the nitty gritty papers that come along with, with the title commitment. And also HOA docs is also big there. Yes. So I've got a whole section on HOA docs. Oh, sorry. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay. The next section um, that where buyers can get out of a contract sometime is uncured title objections. So this is, you know, different things here. Um, you'll where you put in the blank like other you know other activities people will put you know we really don't see a whole lot of value in putting something like single family you know single family use where it is relevant sometimes if you want to put in ground swimming pool or construction of two story house of at least forty five hundred square feet and so then once you get the once you get the title commitment the exception and the survey all three of those. That's when the seller has the um, has the blank number of days. You put something in, you know, five, seven, ten, something like that, where the buyer can review it. And if they see there's an issue that they aren't going to be able to, you know, take do the use that they want. So, you know, if so, if you like, for instance, if you didn't have, if you had not written in construction of a of a pool, and you get a survey back. And there is an abandoned sewer line easement running right in the middle of the backyard. You might, you probably wouldn't have an out for that. But had you have put swimming pool in there, you know, you can't, you're not going to be able to put a pool if, if there's this easement. Or you know, another example might be if you're wanting to build a house of a certain size and you get the survey back and the build line, the line that shows how far. Um, back on the property from the front of the lot, you have to be, if, if, if the numbers don't make sense, if, you know, to build the size of house you want to build, you're going to have to be, you know, fit closer to the street, then that would be, um, that would be something you could object to um, and potentially get out of the contract for. And then, you know, the, some, some neighborhoods don't allow like a second story or something. So if you were planning to, if you put an addition of a second story, uh, that would be something as well. So again, once they you got the the negotiated number of days to make the objection, and then after that, the seller has fifteen days in which a cure period in which they can try to correct the issue. Um, and if it can't be corrected, like you know, if there's a big old easement in the middle of the backyard that's not going to be correctable, um, then the buyer will have. Um, then the buyer has 15 day, five days after the end of the seller's period to, um, to try to cure the objection in which they can cancel. And if you're getting um, just a revised survey or a, or a revised, um, you know, a revised title commitment, you know, sometimes somewhere in the process, you have the same number of days, but it would only be applicable to any new issues um, that were discovered in this in this new um, new document. Um, you can't go back and claim something that you should have known um, in the documents that you had early. All right, so on to muds and pids and all of those kind of fun things. So a muds a mud is a statutory taxing district um, that it, if a property is situated in it, um, often it has to do with, with drainage and sewage and flood control. And we see these a lot of times in outlying areas, a lot of kind of new suburbs, maybe, you know, not that long ago, they were, it was part of an unincorporated area that's now been, you know, annexed by the city of Salina or something like that. And so if you are selling a property that's in a mud, it is imperative that you give notice of this to um, prospective buyers before the um, 
before final execution of the contract. Because if you do not give the notice, um, again, before it's executed, then the buyer has a right where they can terminate the contract all the way up until closing. So that's a, that's a big, broad opening. So um, it's important, you know, when, to do your due diligence if you're listing something that's in a MUD or you think may be in a MUD. And you can find out if it's in a MUD. Look in the tax rolls. There is a line item on there, just like it is. It'll say like county and school um, when it's listing out all the different property taxes. Um, and the reason that this is so important um, that, you know, the buyer's allowed to get it out for that is because MUDs can be really substantial. Um, they can raise, you know, when you start adding that in, um, it could be, it, you know, maybe the, the price per square foot is looking pretty good, you know, for that property. But then you realize you you add in the amount that they're paying, you know, for the MUD and, you know, it raises it another three or $400 a month on what your payment's going to be. So be very careful about that. There is no track form for the MUDs um, about what the notice is going to be. So to get the notice, what your buyer would need, or what, I'm sorry, what you would need to do is the listing agent, you would need to contact the MUD Okay, and get the information um, and they likely have a form and the information that must be included on it includes um, includes the amount of the tax and um, the amount of indebtedness. Um, and so either from the mud or there is the Texas Commission on en Environmental Quality. Um, TCEQ is the acronym for it. And, and that is like, they have a database for, for all MUDs throughout the state of Texas. Okay, similarly, we have PIDs, which are public improvement districts. And this is not a tax per se, and therefore it is not listed in the tax rolls like the MUD is, okay? Um, but for this, same thing, um, it has to be included in the contract. If you don't, they can, if it's not included with the contract, then again, the buyer can, um, the buyer can, can cancel throughout the, the contract. I mean, I ha I've had several agents recently, like in the last two or three months say, oh my gosh, I just realized this property that I'm selling is in a PID and I didn't give them the notice. What, what's, what's the story? And I'm like, well, the buyer can cancel all the way through, but you know, hopefully they won't, but they could, but that, you know, that's a, a big risk um, to put um, your seller in and a lot of liability on yourself as an agent. So definitely do your due diligence. Um, a lot of the PIDs are out in the newer suburbs, Salina, Prosper, um, have have a lot of them, but they can be even in the middle of of the city. Both Dallas and Fort Worth have PIDs that are downtown parts of the downtown areas. Um, and if you go to um, the city of Dallas, city of Fort Worth, city of Plano, um, they have one downtown also. Um, you you can research the you can type in addresses and there are maps. So definitely figure figure that out as well um, to give them the notice. And unlike the MUD notice um, that doesn't have a truck form, there is a form for PIDs. And so what you would do is you would just fill this out and then, you know, give it to the buyer to, to sign and acknowledge. Um, and this is a more general notice. It doesn't have all the numbers and tax rates like the one that you get from, from, the, from the MUD. This is just saying it's part of a district and, you know, it's part of such and such city. So that would need to be attached to your contract. Tidewaters, we're not going to see much of this here in Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, this, but, you know, maybe you're working on something down in Galveston or Padre. Um, it, is, it is a similar um, type of out that if the seller doesn't provide it, then the buyer can cancel throughout the contract. And there is a form for it, the addendum for coastal area property. So, and also similar is propane gas, uh, propane gas districts. Have y'all ever sold anything in a propane gas district? I was just kind of going on a rabbit hole Googling earlier today. 
it looks like there's one near Eagle Mountain Lake, but I couldn't really figure out much about it. But again, it has a special trek addendum also um, that they have to they have to provide. And in addition to that, to providing this addendum, um, there is the last paragraph says that there's a notice from the distribution system re retailer that is required to be recorded um, in any property that is part of a propane district and that notice needs to be included in that also. So long of the short of it, anytime you are selling a property in these districts, they need to be told up the seller needs to tell the buyer prior at or prior to execution um, that um, they are part of this or else the buyer has a very liberal right to cancel. Okay, failure to deliver the seller's disclosure. Um, we always encourage our Briggs, Freeman, Sotheby's and our national realty agents to get the seller's disclosure completed prior to the property going, going live because we don't want this um, to be hanging out there just to have another out for, for the buyers to be able to cancel. Because if you'll look on number two, it says the buyer has not received notice, but within blank number of days after effective date, sellers shall deliver notice. Uh, and once they receive the notice, they the buyer has seven days to in which they can cancel. And it's, you know, it's a liberal right to cancel uh, for any reason. So, for instance, let's say we had a five day option period, but the seller's disclosure, the seller didn't get it to the buyer until day four of of the option period. Um, that would be seven more days. So effectively, it would be like having an 11 day option period. So just stay on your stay on your clients, your sellers to to get the just tell them it has to be completed before it goes into MLS or before you you know start showing it. So you won't have this other this other potential out for a buyer. Any questions? All right. Lender required repairs. Um, this has to do with, we see this a lot. Um, this is when a lender isn't going to close on a property unless certain repairs are made. They're not feeling comfortable enough, you know, um, writing the loan with, without, without things being made. Um, roof, we see that a lot. That's, um, you know, most people, if there's a, a really damaged roof or a roof with an overlay, a lender is going to require that. If there's serious foundation issues, that's another. We see it more, a little more nitpicky, if you will, for um, VA and FHA. I had a VA one that I did just recently. It was a 1930s duplex, and it had a little bit of rotting paint on this one section, and we had to go in, peeling paint, I'm sorry, it was peeling paint, um, but rotted wood, rotting wood is another thing. We had to go in and just put some paint on it. Um, so before, before um, the the lender would fund on it. So if you have this situation, um, it says that unless other, neither party is obligated to pay for a lender required repair. And if the parties do not agree for the lender required repairs and treatments, this contract will terminate and the earnest money will be refunded. Okay, so if neither, if, if there are lender required repairs, neither party, neither the buyer nor the seller will do it, then um, then the buyer can cancel and or either can cancel, but the earnest money is going to be refunded to the buyer. OK, now the, kind of a hitch to this is if the the last sentence says that if the required repairs are over five percent of the value of the sales price, um, the buyer can still cancel. So that means that even if the seller was willing to do these repairs, okay, but they're really substantial. Um, and this is, it's like going to make the buyer really nervous, fear that they're buying a house that's a lemon. 
Um, even if the seller is willing to do it, the buyer can cancel and, and get their money back. Does that make sense? So again, probably roof is where we see this, you know, being the biggest player. Um, and another um, instance of a lender required repair that I forgot to mention is termites and wood destroying insects. That falls under that as well. All right, um, failure to complete repairs. Um, this language was changed um, recently in the contract. So it says that, you know, all repairs and treatments um, have to be done and these these two sections go hand in hand and under 10 possession it says that the seller shall deliver to the buyer sorry my um screen with y'all's faces is blocking like half of my text so um it, it says that um sorry guys okay sorry um, that the seller shall deliver to buyer um the property in the required condition um so they have to it has to be one the con the condition that it was when they contracted on it um so something if something new has come up if something has broken you know in the three weeks since you went under contract they have to have that fixed or the buyer does not have to close um, another situation is if there were was it a repair amendment negotiated then the items that the seller agreed to do in the amendment need to be corrected. And, you know, they keep kind of strengthening, they being truck, keep strengthening this provision. Um, used to be, it just said it had to be corrected. A couple of years ago, they added language saying it has to be done by a licensed professional if it's the type of, um, you know, if it's the type of repair that requires that you can't just, you know, as the owner go out there and fix your HVAC or whatever. And then now it, the latest rendition says that um, it has to, um, we have, the seller has to provide copies and documentations of receipts and invoices. So those have to be provided as proof that they really got it done and got it done by a proper professional. So, um, so again, if as the buyer, um, if this all hasn't been done, um, what you would do is you've got um, up to five days that you have the right to either terminate the contract, you don't have to close, or you can give the seller up to five days um, to, to get the re repairs done right and the documentation in order. Any question about that? All right. Okay. This is one that I did not know about and I'd never heard it in a continuing education class. And I learned about it in this book. Have y'all ever heard of this book? It's called Let the Seller Beware. You can buy it for about $14 on Amazon. Um, I don't know if it has the very latest um, Trek contract changes in it, but it has the one from like two years ago when they changed the option fee delivery. It's a really good, um, it's a really good line by line um, walkthrough breakdown of, of the track contract and the addendum. So it says, if you read this section under closing and everyone's obligations um, under um, B, A, and I'm sorry, B1, seller shall execute and deliver a general warranty deed conveying title. So what this means is that if it's only possible to deliver a special warranty deed, then that isn't out. You wouldn't know this probably till the very end at the closing table, but that is a potential um, exit um, for the buyer. And so uh, the difference between a general warranty deed and a special warranty deed is that a special warranty deed guarantees clear title of the property going back to like the beginning of time, the beginning, you know, since Texas became a state. 
whereas a special warranty deed is only guaranteeing um, clear title during the ownership of this person who is selling it, the seller. Now, all that being said, today it is not so important for us because, you know, 99% of our transactions have title insurance policy along with it. So that's covering any, any title issues. But just legally, um, there there is a difference. A general warranty deed is a lot is a lot stronger of a conveyance instrument. So, um, and here's the thing: um, if you have if you're selling a property that's been foreclosed upon, you probably cannot at some point in its history, not just you know recently, but you know 50 years ago you probably cannot get a general warranty deed. Usually it's a special warranty deed um, that can only be issued after that. So just something to be aware of. Had y'all ever heard this before? No? Okay. Well, I, could I, you, question, could, yes. you add, could you add to special, then what yes. you would do would be to add to special provisions or something a line item that we will only be able to provide. Yes, exactly. That, yes. And if Still you do that, then, that, then you're okay. If then you you're do. okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if, if something's in an estate, depending on how the, the person died, you know, with or without a will or whatever, is that another case where they can only do um, a special sometimes? Mm -hmm. Or is that, what, did I maybe just run upon one that was a, Weird. I I don't think as an estate necessarily, you know, makes it become, you know, never a general warranty deed situation. So right. yeah. Okay. But yeah, I just thought that was interesting. I want to look into I want to talk to some title company people about that a little more just because I think it's interesting and it's something. You know, if you've been in this business long, long, long enough and you've gone to all these classes, you hear most things at some point. But this one I'd never heard. So. All well, right. And you know what? Sometimes there are delinquent taxes that are going to get paid off at closing. Mm -hmm. um, and. I mean, do you need to. I've actually had that where people didn't pay their taxes and they were just waiting. Um, oh, right. No, a lot of liens and stuff. I mean, they really don't pay until they can't until it funds. Right. Yeah. So, but it says, you know, furnish tax state oh. certificates showing no delinquent taxes. So I'm saying, should, should you write up something specific if you find out there are unpaid taxes? Do you need to, do you need I don't to think you need to, but you know, because a title company, they're not going to risk funding on that either. You know, they're right. going to make sure, but, but that, that is true. The way it's written, it does kind of seem like that, but yeah, it's kind of, you can't do one without the other. They can't pay their taxes until they have their. Angela, uh -huh. it's usually indicated that when the title commitments issued, the title company will state on there that these are taxes need to be paid. That's a contingent. Right. That's in that right. section of, of issuing C the title of policy it. at closing. So, so yeah. maybe that addresses this. And I, I mean, I've just never, I've never paid enough attention to the part about the no delinquent taxes mm -hmm. to wonder if we need to say anything about it right no because like like she said the, the title commitment they, they, it's saying that they're not going to issue the title which is a contingent condition for closing before that that is that is you know done okay sorry okay so great question failure to close so um what if it's closing day and one of the parties doesn't show up for closing you know are they in default does that mean the other party you know can walk away and get their earnest money back with him and that the, the question here <coughs> becomes what is reasonable you know um as we all know there are always not always but a lot of times like lender issues where you know, the documents are late. Sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's a week. Um, what is reasonable? Uh, you know, the other party is going to be screaming. Does that mean, you know, and usually the other parties who wants to be closing is saying, I'm done with these people. I'm going to go on and put it back on the market. Can they, do they have the right to do that? Is that really an out for them? 
Well, this section, they don't have a time is of the essence clause, you know, saying that it has to be done. It says honor before, but, and, you know, if you know you're going to be a couple of days late, it is highly advisable that you negotiate, um, that you let the other party know and, you know, do an extension for two or three days or however long they're telling you. But if, but if you can't, are you really in default? Probably not if it's a couple of days. If it becomes a week, definitely two weeks, then yes. Um, who has some horror stories or just not horror stories necessarily, but you know, prior experiences with late late closings? Um, Susan, Penny, Madeline, I know y'all, y'all are my veterans. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always heard that. Um, you know, if it's just a couple of days and honestly, sometimes, uh, people aren't going to sign an amendment, you know, willingly exactly, uh, to extend, but I have had, um, title company attorneys say that that does not constitute like a default, right. you know, if it's just a couple of days. Um, I think where you really get in trouble is if somebody writes it as a cash offer and then goes and puts financing on it without telling, without really, you know, uh, saying anything about it. And then their lender is late. Right. Well, and that's going to come to a screeching halt, too, with the way they've rewritten page one of the contract, you know, about right. what, what is cash. Yeah, I think if it becomes a couple of days after closing if that time comes or three and the buyer still hasn't closed but they have every intention of closing it's just taking a while it's really not a great place for the seller to be in they've got them between a rock and a hard place because mm -hmm. what are they going to do try and sue them no they're not right. they know yeah. they're going to close anyway you know it's not the right thing for a buyer to do certainly but it happens frequently and there's not a lot a seller can do unless yep. they just want to close the door on it say you're in default and start the legal process but that costs time and money and if they would have closed then what was the point of that just to make yeah, point? yeah. angela yeah. Mad madeline's got a great story she'll tell you later okay about... <laughs> okay i'll 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 make her tell me <laughs> i've okay. forgotten about it thank you very much <laughs> i prefer not to think about that <laughs> sorry <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so Thanks next for bringing we, it up, Sue. <laughs> so the next thing is casualty loss. You oh, know what? Sorry. Wait, did Angela. you have a question, Rosemary? Yes, please. Sorry. Yeah. So I was always so cautious, right? If I had buyers who were going to be late, or if I was on the selling side and I heard that buyer, so am I hearing that this panic that I have to amend the date isn't even necessary? Like it's if they're going it's to be a late? best pra it's a best practice, but sometimes. Okay. It's hard. I mean, if it's going to be two, like we said, two or three days late, if it's going to be a week, week and a half, yeah, you you need to do something. Okay, but because I was just the black and white contract says on or before, so if they were going to be late, I was always cautious. Yeah. The first, I knew that it's like ah, eh, you didn't close. I'm like seriously. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, it's it's going to be hard to call call like you know call default on something if you know like their intentions are there it's just a, a little bit of a paperwork nightmare uh, you know a paperwork delay so okay. well and right now with leasebacks and things the way they are it's usually not that big a deal because it's not like the moving van is sitting in the driveway right um, and so yeah the, the coming to an agreement part hasn't been an issue knock on wood but i was always making sure i had it in writing I guess that was my point. Like, I, I guess well, try I was, to, I mean, definitely, okay. definitely try to, but you know, so it's like, we were like, um, so I can't remember who said it, but sometimes they're going to be kind of grumpy and say, no, we're not, you, you're supposed to close tomorrow. We're not going to say, you know, amend this until Friday. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm just you are so welcome. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So kind of the last thing to talk about in the main contract before we talk about contract addenda is casualty loss. So seen a lot of this in recent years with the tornado, with hailstorms, things like that, where all or part of the property is damaged or destroyed. Then you know what rights, um, what rights does the buyer have to continue forward 
with the closing. So if the buy, if the seller, it says that the seller shall restore the property to the, you know, the condition um, as soon as reasonably possible um, by the closing date. But if they can't, then the buyer has three options. They can terminate the contract. They can agree to extend closing for 15 days, or they can close on the property in its damaged states and accept the insurance proceeds for it. Now, big asterisk for that last one, you're, you're going to have to have an insurance company that agrees to, to that situation, and which I think is, is the biggest challenge there. Um, a lot of insurance companies won't agree to assign the proceeds. So, um, so you got to kind of work through that. Usually, usually this involves, uh, you know, just in having when I when that tornado, not tornado, that hail store came came through in 2012. I, I had four houses under contract in East Dallas, three of whom needed new roofs. You know, so we pretty much had to agree to ex extend everything. So. But um, but if the buyer was looking for an out, you know, maybe an act of God is allowed for them to have one. So, okay, now let's talk about buyers outs under the addendum. So third-party financing addendum, um, there are two specific approvals um, set forth. And this, there is the buyer approval um, and there is the property approval. So one has everything to do with the buyer and their credit worthiness and job status and all that. And the other one, has everything to do with the property and nothing to do with the buyer. So looking at the buyer one first, if this if this first box is checked saying that um, the buyer um, the contract the buyer's obligation to purchase the contract is dependent upon their um, being deemed you know get get pre approved fully approved not just pre approved um, within a set number of days and they don't. So um, then that, that is an out, you know, let's say you have a seven day option and a 14 day financing option here and you can't, they just, you know, it was, it was tight and, you know, maybe interest rates rose a little or something happened, uh, you know, they lost their job, then they, they're able to get out under, under this provision. Property approval, this largely has, it has to do with insurability, but also it has mostly to do with the appraisal of the property. And this is saying that if the buyer, if the property does not appraise and, um, and the lender lets the buyer know, who lets the seller know, no later than three days before the closing date, then the buyer has the right to terminate the contract. So, and this three days is really critical here. I can't tell you how many times I've had calls from agents who say, we just got the appraisal back. It didn't meet appraisal and our closing date is tomorrow. And it's like, well, I wish you would have had this news for me three days ago because then you guys could have canceled or what more realistically happens is you negotiate, um, you negotiate to split the difference um, in the amount that the, that the buyer is going to have to come out of pocket with. But so when you do have a buyer and a proper and you're waiting for appraisal and you're getting closer to that closing date, keep a close eye on that date. So if necessary, you can try to amend the contract um, to either pull out the closing date or, or you know, agree to alter alter that that the date um, when when that is is given. Because um, of course we have the appraisal addendum, which takes away the protections um, to the buyer that are given in the third party financing addendum. So, um, paragraph one, I should have printed the whole um, thing, the whole addendum, but I didn't. But um, I think y'all probably have, have heard this speech a lot. Um, the, the first paragraph of the appraisal addendum is the one that is most favorable to the seller where the buyer is saying, yeah, despite whatever is, is said in the third party financing addendum, and no matter how low the appraisal is, I, I want this house. I'm ready. I'm willing and able to make up the difference. So um, no out there for the buyer because that takes the total out away. 
But if number two is checked, that's the partial waiver. That's when the buyer is saying, okay, I'm ready to take some risk. Let's say the property is listed for a million dollars um, or you know, I'm paying a million dollars, but uh, if it comes in below 950, I'm just not comfortable. So, um, and, you know, I want to be able to walk, but I could make up that difference between 950 and a million. So if the property comes in at 949, then the buyer has the ability to cancel just like he did under the, under the third party financing addendum. But if it comes in at 951, He's going to have to come up with um, with the difference, um, the loan ratio for that forty nine thousand dollar difference. So that is an out there for the buyer. Um, paragraph four of the appraisal addendum. This is very rarely used. It is used mostly when a buyer is putting down a lot, say fifty percent or so. Um, of the purchase price, but they just want to know that they are, and so they're going to be able to close on the loan because it's still a great um, investment for the for the lender because there's going to be so much equity in it um, that they're willing to do it, even though it's not going to be at sales value. But they want to make sure they are making a good. The buyer wants to make sure they're making a sound investment. So let's say. Um, it's a million dollar lot and they want to make sure that you know they put 950 again they want to make but but they're they're putting down 500,000 right so even though it's going to appraise say at you know 9 if it appraises really low they want to be able to below that they want to be able to get out even though they could still get the loan so that's adding another level um, of, of an out um, and protection to the buyer. All right, the backup addendum. So if you are in a backup position, there is the opportunity here for two separate option periods. So, so long as you, the buyer, deliver um, an option fee up front, and it can be a small option fee. We've talked about this a lot at Legal Minutes and, um, I won't get into that now, but if you ever have questions, give me a call. Um, so this is when you're in second place for a contract. So you want to, and in saying that if the first contract um, does not terminate before a certain date, um, then the earnest money will be refunded to the, the buyer of the second contract. So um, that would be an out for the for the buyer if you never became primary. And then also with the option fee, if you do pay an option fee up front, you would have two options. You would have an option fee for the entire time that you're in backup position. So if you wanted to ride along, you know, the, the primary contract and see, you know, you know, maybe something, you know, you're past the option fee, the option period, the financing period, but who knows, there's a, you know, a 0.1% chance it won't close. But, you know, three weeks later, you find something else, you can cancel this, if you've paid your option fee, you can cancel um, while you're in backup. Um, also, in addition to having that option period throughout the backup period, once you become primary, if and when you become primary, um, you would have a normal option fee, an option period, whatever number of days you put in the in the contract, you know, five, five, seven days, whatever that is, um, from the amended effective date, which would mean the day that you became primary. So, okay, so leases, how are we time-wise? Okay, we've got about eight minutes. Um, Leases and lease addenda, this has to do with the language that was added to the first page of the Trek 1 to 4 contract about two years ago, um, where they also came up with um, the addenda for fixture lease and addenda for residential lease. Um, here, is, here are those two documents. So again, with the residential lease, this is different than a lease back, a seller lease back. Um, this has to do if the property or it, the whole or any part of the property 
is leased. So you're selling an investment house, um, you know, that you've owned and have had tenants in there for a couple of years, or you're selling your main residence, which includes a back house that has a tenant. So this is when you would use this document. So um, this document requires that you provide, that the seller provide the buyer with a copy of the residential lease um, because they've got to know the terms of that lease. So it makes sense. So, so long as they are doing that, they have three days. Um, so right here, if you look um, under um, B1, it says that buyer has received a copy of all residential leases or um, the next box is buyer has not received a copy of the lease and that seller shall provide a copy of the lease within three days after the effective date. And then buyer has the right to terminate the contract within blank number of days after they receive the lease. So again, just like with the seller's disclosure notice, if you're listing a property that has a lease, get the lease up front and provide it to the to the interested parties if you've got someone telling you they're going to make an offer um have them do that have say well okay here's the here's the lease so they can check that box and you won't have another time period lingering out there very similarly on the addendum regarding fixture leases um same thing about um, under B, they've received a copy of the lease, or if they have not received a copy of the lease, um, in this instance, they have five days to deliver, and then seven days after that, um, in which the buyer can terminate. So fixture lease, largely solar panels, security and security systems seem to be the main ones we, we seem to deal with. So get, get have those leases ready. Um, Natural resource leases. Um, there's not a truck addendum about these, but um, same situation um, in the in the body of page one of the truck contract, saying that either the sellers delivered a copy of the natural resource leases or that they have not delivered. And if they've not delivered, it mimics the language of the residential lease addendum, saying they have three days to the deliver and then a negotiated period. Um, in which the buyer can cancel after they get those. All right, HOAs. Um, you're selling a home. This would have to do with a townhouse or a single family home versus a condo. We'll touch on the condo contract in a second because it has similar language, but it's included in the body of the condo contract instead of having um, a separate addendum to it. So addendum for property subject to a mandatory membership in a property owners association. Um, so there are a lot of fees and costs and regulations. So we want to make sure if you are, um, if you own a property in a mandatory HOA. So we want to make sure that the buyer has proper notice um, about it to, to know what they are getting into. So again, there's blank saying that um, if you look under A3, if they have received the subdivision information and the subdivision information includes the CCNRs, which are just all the, I mean, it could be 50 or 200 pages of just all the regulations of what you can and can't do history of, of the subdivision. So there's that. And then there's a one page document called the resale certificate. Um, that the homeowners association needs to fill out with kind of a, a summary of, of the of what's going on financially with, with the HOA. So that those are the documents that need to be delivered to the buyer. So again, if you have given, if you have obtained these, if you have a list uh, listing in a mandatory HOA, it is great to try to work on getting these done up front because you know depending on. You know, the, the, the particular HOA, it can take up to several weeks um, to get these documents. So, and again, it's best to have that taken care of so you can check that box. If not, if you don't have them yet, when you get a contract, then you would check um, one of the first two boxes um, saying either the buyer or seller, usually it's the seller, will we'll get the We'll get the HOA docs, and then it says they have three days 
to terminate after they receive those documents. And this is often a this is often a situation where, like I said, it can take a couple of weeks. So it can really linger on out there. You can be a week past your option, you know, and you're still waiting on your HOA documents. And then you finally get them. And then they have, um, then they have another three days to cancel for, for any reason. Does not have, does not have to be tied to what the HOA docs say. They can, it's just, um, it's just a, a big giant, um, a big giant out for, for the buyers. Um, also in this um, HOA addendum under B material changes, if seller becomes aware of any material changes, they shall give notice to the buyer and the, the buyer may terminate if any material change um, occurs prior to the closing. Be aware of this. Um, I've had several agents in situations involving this provision in the last couple of years as more and more HOAs really start regulating short-term rentals. So, um, and, and the ratio of rentals, you know, there, there could be a meeting, you know, the day after you go under contract um, and they haven't had a chance to, you know, get into all the documents. But if the seller knows this, um, this, this could be, this could be, um, you know, an, an out for the buyer. So just really be aware of that kind of in, in this environment we're in. Okay, so um, as I said, um, here's the first page of the condo contract. It says, um, it, it has very similar language um, down towards the bottom under C about delivering the, the certificate and documents, um, but the timing's a little different. They've got that full out to cancel within seven days after the resale certificate. So it's even a broader out for the buyers when they're doing condos. Okay, so again, um, we talked early on about proper notice. Um, whenever you do want to give you know, notice, like official notice of cancellation, um, do be sure to, to make, to, give notice to every everyone that is listed, even the principals. And that's why it's really important because it really muddies things up when people do not fill out this section, which um, I'm sure y'all all have had contracts that you get and it's totally blank. So it kind of puts you in a bind like, who do I let know? Um, these are the forms for the, there's the seller termination of contract and the buyer termination of contract. As you can see on the seller, the one um, really basic one that, you know, we talked about up front is the failure to deliver earnest money. That's, that's um, you know, other than some like peculiar, peculiar situations or maybe buyer failed to close, you know, that might be something you'd write into number two, but number one um, would be what you use, whereas there's a whole litany of things to choose from, all of which we discussed um, uh, for the buyer's um, termination, um, option fee, financing, third um, HOA, condo, um, failed to dis dis seller's disclosure and a bunch of other items. So, and then, so release of earnest money, this is just kind of a logistical thing. You know, most title companies will go ahead and release the option fee without having to have everybody, you know, both parties and both, um, both agents sign off on the release of earnest money, but sometimes it gets more contentious and tricky and people want to fight you um, uh, even though you're exercising one of one of those rights that we've discussed today and that are listed on the on the the notice um, on, on the notice of termination but this form is likely going to be required for the title company to release it and I think that is about it what questions do you guys have for me Anyone?